All right, so hi, I'm Jeff Mendelson. I'm a senior software engineer at Bloomberg. Um, my talk today is introducing walkway uh, free algorithms. Not so much giving examples or details, but sort of just giving an introductory definition, trying to remove some of the mystery, trying to get more people involved with working with concurrent code. Um, OK. So to recap what I've said so far, I'm Jeff. Um, Please interrupt with questions and give me feedback as we go along. Uh, I don't do well talking into the void. I'll start making bad jokes and things will degrade really quickly. Case in point. Okay. And again, I'm, I'm trying to provide a working understanding of walk weight free algorithms. Um, nothing exact, nothing too detailed, nothing too complex, just something that can get you into a conversation. Um, so I'm going to start with sort of describing how we got here, how we have a need for this definition in the first place. Um, I'll have to go through what are synchronization primitives and some of the problems associated with them. Uh, give some simple definitions. I have a new one. Uh, I have a new one mostly so that my talk would be accepted. It doesn't have any particular value over the other ones, as we'll see. Um, but I do try to tie them all together to make sure they're all giving the same type of definition, the same type of content. Um, then we'll very briefly ask, you know, do we even want lock weight free algorithms? Is there any particular value in them? Um, just, just to get you shocked now so you pay attention. Um, I don't think there's a particular value in lock-free algorithms, and that's kind of contradictory to what you expected, I hope. Um, there's a lot of value in what we do to make something lock-free, uh, if that makes sense. So it's more a journey as opposed to a destination, in my mind, for lock freedom. Uh, weight freedom, though, is very concrete and valuable where you use it. And I'll give some brief overview to some of the approaches, some of the background techniques for lock and wait free algorithms. Um, good so far. Looks good. Thank you. So how we got here? Um, I don't know what brief subset of history I should give you here. So I'll just say Abacus really revolutionized how we did addition. It was great. Um, then you know, a little bit of time passed and we have computers. Um, computers do a lot of computations, do a lot faster. Great tool. We love them. Um, how do we make them better? Well, we make them faster. Right, whatever we're doing, doing it in less time is better. Um, so we increase the speed, you know, we decrease the size of these things, they, they become more and more powerful. At some point we reached, at some point we reached the point, sorry about that, um, we're just making it smaller, faster, wasn't so easy. Um, so we said, let's just have more of them. And we, now we have multi-cores and things are great. Um, so through this history, um, well, that was the, sort of the hardware side of, of computers. Through this history, where was the software side? Well, you know, do a computation, run a program, run multiple programs at the same time. But we're still doing it on one core. So that required some technology. Then we, had, we branched out into hardware, and we needed some way to paralyze our work over these different pieces of hardware. Why? Why couldn't we just run one program on one core? Well, we, we want to reduce latency. We want to be able to do a big computation across all the hardware, whether it's cores or GPUs or um, AI hardware. Uh, we just want more. We're just people, I guess. Um, the problem with that was now, if I take a computation and I break it over a bunch of cores, somewhere I have to take those results and recombine them. There has to be synchronization. I and mean, that's just one example. There's other types of synchronization needed, but let's move on. So what is a synchronization primitive? A synchronization primitive is something that synchronizes. Uh, I take different things and I want to bring them together at the same point in time. I take a matrix multiplication, I break it up into a lot of pieces, I send each piece to a core, they do their work, and then I have to recombine those results to get the final result. Um, that's sort of like a barrier, sort of like a, everything comes together and gets put together. I could have a different problem. I could say, well, I have a bank account, which, you know, classically, and um, I have different things that are trying to update that balance, and I need to make sure they happen one after the other as opposed to at the same time and corrupt the data. Um, I might have a mutual exclusion problem, so to speak. Uh, so some of the common mechanisms you may have heard of are mutex, barrier, semaphore. So mutex allows one thing through, barrier um, requires like n things to come together. Uh, semaphore says instead of one thing going through, you know, I can have three things going through, just some number. Again, I'm being very high level, very simple here. If you want to grill me because I'm upsetting you, please do so. But I still don't see any hands. Um, so these are great, um, but they're, they're kind of really not what I want. All right, I, I went ahead and I made my computers fast. I made them have lots of different 
pieces of hardware, and now I'm saying only one thing can go through at a time. Um, it's, it's kind of the opposite. I mean, I, if, if my goal is latency, you know, for a system, that, that's very counter to that goal. If my goal is throughput, I've restricted what this one program can do, how much of the hardware it can use. Yes, maybe I have enough things running on that hardware to keep it busy. That's my ultimate goal, I guess, right, is to keep my hardware busy. Um, but this one particular program uh, is going to become more latent. Um, so common problems with, synchron with synchronization programs we're not going to talk about here really besides what we just discussed. So like deadlock, which I don't know why I have here. It's kind of a bug. You know, I have uh, A waiting for B, B waiting for A, and they, neither can go forward would be deadlock. Um, that, again, that's more of a bug than a, than a problem. And priority inversion, right? Say I have some work which is really important, I want to do it quickly, but somehow it ends up waiting for something with very low priority, um, and it takes it a long time to complete. Again, that's not really the topic here. Um, what is the topic is, is the lack of progress. That I, I've, if, I make, if I use a mutex, I've brought everything together, and only one thing can continue. I wanted to have you know, 100 things running at this time, this time on, spread over the hardware, and I can only have one. Um, and that's kind of where the lock-free and wait-free comes in. It's, it's making sure we do have some measure of progress. Um, so I'm going to introduce a new definition for lock-free and wait-free. Um, there's nothing, again, special about this, or it's just a different one to talk about. Um, there's a problem with lock-free, is that there, if you did a search, you'd find multiple different definitions, and some of them are really complicated. Um, like I saw one that said, if I try something an infinite number of times, it succeeds an infinite number of times. Anything with two infinites is not fun. Um, why? Why isn't there a simple definition we all agree on? Why is there not one way of saying what we want for lock freedom? And again, I come back to, I don't think lock freedom has value. Um, it's hard to say something doesn't have value when I haven't defined it. Um, so let's try to boil through this chicken and egg problem a little bit. I'm going to say for every sub, so I'm going to say threads. It could be processes, it could be whatever, whatever runs on a computer. Uh, for every subset of threads, at least one of the threads can make progress. Um, so what, what does that mean? Let's say I had a reader writer lock. All right, I have a bunch of readers going through and they're all happy. That's a good thing. All of a sudden, this writer comes up and he says, no, all you readers got to wait. And those guys get blocked and they're, they're not scheduled anymore. The writer can make progress. However, if I look at a subset that only contains readers, um, they can't make progress. They're, they're waiting. Is that a problem or not? It's up for debate, um, but it would not be lock free. And that's kind of what you'd expect because it has a reader writer lock. So I emphasize the word lock there. Maybe it should be nice if I defined lock. That's kind of a problem. What is a lock? Um, I think we could say like a mutex or some of these other synchronization programs we said before is a lock. There's also sort of things you can do in code which cause locks. Um, and the word lock itself becomes a problem. Um, so is my definition pretty clear and simple to apply? I, I think, OK. So for weight freedom, um, which I think has a lot of value if you need it, um, all the threads can make progress. Anything scheduled will make progress. Um, it won't block. It won't need to be uh, unscheduled. It won't have to wait for anyone else. That's hard to accomplish. Um, so let's move through some more definitions, and then I'll come back. So the simplest definition I can find for lock freedom is there are no locks. And as we, that, that it's kind of a totality, I guess. Um, I don't know what to say here. The problem with this definition is the definition of locks. I think in most people's minds it doesn't meet all the requirements because it's possible to have situations where threads wait infinitely um, and can't make progress, but they're not using a lock. Um, I don't want to into too many details. So there is a similar definition for weight freedom. There is no waiting. Um, so what would that mean to people? It would mean there's like no loops. That's not exactly right either, because uh, loops are fine. It's just that loops have to be bounded in how long they run. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Am I good so far? I really feel need to make jokes. No. Um, so this is, I took from Just Software Solutions blog. Uh, lock free. If any thread is suspended, the other threads must still be able to complete their tasks. Um, so you can imagine if I have a thread which takes a mutex, and then I have five other threads that block on that mutex. That is unfortunate because I did not see that on my screen. 
Give me a second. I know you want to minimize. Uh, How do I kill that? I don't have a deferral. I didn't quick start. I clicked to submit, I think, so I don't know what that does. Uh, we'll find out. It'll be an adventure between us. Um, so if I have a mutex, and a thread has that mutex, and I have a bunch of other threads blocked in that mutex, if that one thread with the mutex never comes back, I never make progress again. Now, I mean, we can debate whether if that thread crashes, is that really a problem or is that a bug? Um, but if that one thread never comes back, I never make progress again. And that's a problem, right? We want our programs to make progress. We want them to eventually complete. Um, and that's sort of where lock freedom is taking us. We want things to, we want this program to always be able to move forward. We want it to always be using some amount of hardware. Um, weight freedom says not only, if the, whatever the set of threads are that are in memory and running, um, each of them will complete in a bounded number of steps. Um, the interesting thing here is the bounded number of steps, right? When we hear that, we think, oh, it's going to complete in five steps. Great. Uh, well, maybe it's 50. Well, maybe bounded means it's, it's, it's bounded in the sense of big O notation, right, on, the, on arbitrary things. Um, the interesting thing it may be bounded by is the number of threads itself. So if you go looking through on the web and you find the weight-free with, like, three different types of weight-free, um, I don't know why it said that. I should have just said two. But let's go with three is the common one. One is, is kind of vague. And the other two are separated with whether or not the boundedness includes the number of threads. Um, and that's the big difference there. Another definition from C++ concurrency in action. This is getting a bit more detailed. Um, if multiple threads are operating in a data structure, then after a bounded number of steps, one of them will complete its operation. And again, bounded can include number of threads, so it can actually be <coughs> you know, some sort of loop where um, if the threads come into the loop, as long as they're ordered, it'll always finish in a bounded number of steps. Um, and wait for you as every thread working on it will uh, complete in a, num in a bounded number of steps. Am I good so far? Um, so I claim that while there's difference in the details of the definitions, it's, it's somewhat meaningless. It's somewhat... Walk free is saying something will move forward. Wait free is saying everything will move forward. Um, so let me just move on. So do we want weight freedom? Uh, so weight freedom has this, this property. So everything finishes in about the number of steps, although it may be you know, linear or whatever in the number of threads. Um, uh, it gives us that runtime guarantee. So if you have something which is truly mission critical, if something is truly life and death or Whatever. We might want this guarantee. We may need this guarantee. If we, have, if we were in a self-driving car, it may need to finish this operation in a millisecond. And weight freedom is the only thing that's going to give you that guarantee. And that's a very concrete goal, so it has a very consistent definition across the board. Um, unfortunately, implementing right, excuse me, weight-free algorithms are very complicated, and they tend to be slow. Um, so if you need the guarantee, weight freedom is definitely important to you. Uh, if you don't need it, it's probably not something you're ever going to see in your life. Oop, no, I thought I had a question. Uh, lock freedom. So this guarantee of one thread making progress, is that useful? Yes, it, it's a good thing to have. It's good to know your program is going to eventually finish. Um, is that really what I care about? I, I don't think so. I care about my program running quickly. Um, and the things I do to make something lock free give me lower, lower overhead, and um, my, my code runs faster. And that's a, that's a goal I think we all share. So again, the path, I think, is very important there. The, the destination, not so much. Um, the code for lock-free algorithms tends to be a little more complicated. Um, by little, I mean, you know, elementary school, like grad school. Um, but it's not impossible. And, and they have some common themes. Um, So another thing we skipped over is when we say something is locked free, um, we generally don't mean it. Um, you can imagine, for example, like on a queue, if I had a push operation, I wanted the push operation to be locked free. Well, if, that, if, the, if the queue is a bounded amount of memory, it should block the threads. 
That could be part of the contract. Hey, if it's full, block the threads trying to push. That's not a bad thing. Um, so I might say the fast path is, is lock free. Um, so again, we're having trouble with the lock free definition because we need to qualify it on what it's applying to. And I have five minutes. Thank you. That's the first bit of feedback I've had. Um, all right, let's move on. So I, every time I've done this slide, I've messed it up. I, you'd think I'd put a note in for myself, but I haven't. Uh, so compare and swap is something you'll typically find in lock-free algorithms. Why do I specifically mention that atomic operation as opposed to other ones? Um, so does everyone know what compare and swap is? And I've got to talk really fast because I only have five minutes. Um, so, oh, we have someone who knows, but I can't ask you because i got to go. Um, I have a value. The value is three. Some point, so at some point, I look at the value, and I see it's three. I say, well, if it's, uh, the compare and swap says, if, it's, if that value is three, make it a five. Good so far. OK. Uh, the problem is I looked and said, saw it was a three here, and down here I'm saying, if it's a three, make it a five. Something could have happened in between. Could have became four. Right, so if, if the value goes to four and I say, hey, if it's three, make it a five, it's going to say, no, you, you failed that. It's actually four now, and re rethink what you got to think. Um, so this is very common, and uh, I guess the most common place you'd see it is in a linked list implementation, where you want to push to the head of the list. Um, I create a new node, I set the, the next pointer to the head, and then I compare and swap the pointer to this new node to the, to the and I've lost you. No? Good? Okay, so I compare and swap. Uh, now, if some other thread came through, it could have replaced the head already, and this fails, and I retry. Okay, but I just said I retry. I may have to retry an infinite number of times. How can I retry an infinite number of times if it's lock-free? Um, well, the, the idea of lock-free is that one thread is making progress. It doesn't mean it's this thread. Right? Every time I fail means some other thread swapped that head out, and it made progress. So we're good. Um, you also find some complicated accounting. How can I only have five? Oh, I, had, I took a break. No. You can also find some complicated accounting in lock-free algorithms where you're tracking like the number of threads that have come in to read, the number of threads that are going to try again, that are attempting to read or are blocked waiting to read and things like that. Um, <coughs> in wait-free algorithms, you, t you tend to find work transfer. Uh, I'm doing an operation. I can't go any further because some other thread is doing something. I'm going to tell the other thread to finish my operation. Um, and since we're allowed to be bounded by the number of threads, that, that works fine in the wait-free definition. Good so far? OK. And that's kind of where I wanted to go. Um, if I didn't accomplish my goal of giving a quick five-minute introduction in 15 minutes, tell me now. All right, thank you.